Let me read to you, just write this down. I want you for a moment, just humor me, close your eyes. Let me read you the second coming of Christ here in verse, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Close your eyes and just imagine this. Picture it in your mind. Forget all the pictures you know and have seen. Here it is, verse 11. Now I saw, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself ruled them with a rod of iron. He himself treaded the into the fierceness of, and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Open your eyes. Is that a little different picture than what we have hanging on the wall? It's a lot different, right? Jesus is Lord. He's coming back, according to Isaiah. He's coming back. And he's, he's not going to be looking like the pictures that we have of him. Uh, again, I want, I, want, I want you to see this. He comes back. And out of his mouth goes a sword. Let's, uh, let me read to you again this part here. Uh, verse 14. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Do you know who that is? Do you know who that is? That's us. We're coming with it. But see, we don't have to fight this war. Because with just the word. So, with his spoken word. And so go back to that, or stay in Isaiah here. Let's, let's, let's go on. So he is the Lord who invites us. He invites us to come into his presence. He wants us to be there. He wants us to know he, there's coming a time he's returning. Skip verse 11 because we're going to come back to that at the end. Verse 12. He's the Lord of creation. The Lord is the Lord of creation. It says there in verse 12, Who has measured the waters? In the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. Do you know that God knows where every single speck of every single dust and dirt and sand there is? Let your mind wrap around that for just a second. And if he knows all that, well, let's, let's finish reading that verse. Weigh the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. If he knows where every grain and has them known and knows where everything is, do you think that he knows about you? That is the Lord we serve. Take a moment and let that sink in for just a moment. Do you think he cares about you? Okay. He's the Lord of all creation. Do you realize that it's, it's through Him in the beginning was the Word, John says. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes on and talks about without Him, nothing was made that was made. It was Christ who created. He is the Lord, the Creator of the universe. He is the Creator. He's the one who spoke it into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was. That is the Lord that we serve. He's a liar, lunatic, or Lord, and the Lord... If he is, and we believe he is. That's the Lord we speak of. Look at verse 13. He's also the Lord of wisdom. Now listen to this verse. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or has, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Who did, how many of you instructed God? How many of you taught God? We, we would not say that, right? We would never say it, but we've tried. Right? How many times have we tried to instruct God? In so many ways, God, you should, you should have done it like this. You know, this would have turned out much, much easier had you done it this way, right? You ever been there? I've been there a couple times. Once. <laughs> We've all been there. We've, we've had the audacity to, to direct God. 
to suggest. And there's nothing wrong in that in and of itself, but how silly is that? Who is it that counseled and taught him? Scripture says, God says, my ways are not your ways. And then I look back and I think, thank you, God, for my ways not being your ways. He's also the Lord of all nations. Look at verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor is be sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as what? Nothing. And they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. I'll say this till I die. We live in the greatest <laughs> country in the world. The greatest nation in the world. And the Lord is the Lord of all nations. Not just ours. But I want to say this. <coughs> Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Amen. So the opposite of that has to be true. Think about that. If blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the opposite of that has to be true, then what does that say? Cursed is the nation whose God is not. You see, he is the Lord of all nations, and if we start erasing him from it, we're in big trouble. But regardless, he's the Lord of this nation. Look at verse 18. He is also the Lord, <laughs> the Lord over all other gods. Look at verse 18. To whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image. The goldsmiths overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever, whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. <coughs> he seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a the image that will not totter. Go over to verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall be my equal? Says the, the Holy One. So, he says he is the Lord over all idols. I've been rolling this passage over and I was thinking, you know, we don't have idols like they did back then. You understand that, right? Their idols were, were statues, images where they would literally, almost sometimes literally bow down to or worship or make sacrifices to and all of that. I don't know anybody, unless there's some, you know, psychopath, that you have a little room in your closet somewhere and you have idols there where you, you know, cut things and kill things and you know, we don't have those, right? We have different idols. We have different idols. They're, they're things that only, I mean, I can list a lot of different, anything can be an idol. If everything is spiritual, then anything and everything can become an idol, right? Now, I was thinking about this, and I was mulling this over. How many times have we made a judgment call on somebody and said, they need to get rid of that idol? Been there. They need to get rid of that. And you know what hit me? I think I guess God just revealed this to me, I'd say. But the, we always say, and I'm guilty of this, they need to get rid of that idol and do this. Ever done that? <coughs> oh, yeah. You're in trouble because you started some of this too last week. <laughs> By the way, Give, you, you did this too. You, you said, how am I going to top that? I don't think I didn't watch the video and catch... Is Nancy here? She's guilty too. <laughs> the moment we say they need to get rid of that idol and do this, sometimes this reveals our oh, idol. Because this may not be what they need. You understand what I'm saying? The moment that we say they need to get rid of that idol, they need to do it my way. Mm -hmm. Well, we wouldn't say that out loud, but we'd say they need to do this. Sometimes, not always, sometimes reveals our idol. Because God may say, that's not what they need at all. They need to do this. But God is the God who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. 
as we said earlier in, in the book of Revelation, he's the king of kings and lord of lords. King of kings and lord of lords. That's the Lord. Now let's go to verse 28. Isaiah writes, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the what? The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. Well, I hope not. If so, we're in trouble. Right? He neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. That's why we can't teach him. It's, it's unsearchable. It's, it's unfathomable, his knowledge. I mean, I, I often say this. Think about this for just a moment. How many of you love to read? Anybody? Do you love me? Imagine knowing and memorizing every book you've ever read. Now imagine memorizing. Everybody hold your hands back up. Who's ever read a book? If you've ever read a book. Imagine, look around, look around. Keep your hands up. Imagine memorizing not only the ones you've ever read. Imagine not only memorizing the ones you've read, but the ones that everybody else has read. And having that kind of knowledge. Imagine all of the chemistry books and the science books and all of that, and having all that knowledge memorized. Imagine all of the books put together, you have memorized that. All the knowledge that's not in those books in libraries throughout the world. Imagine having all of that knowledge. We can't fathom that, right? Imagine that to the nth degree, and that's God, and it never ends. And he's the God who is, is his knowledge is unsearchable. Here we are going to tell him how to do this. Really? Seriously. I want to smack myself sometimes. Really, Mark? Are you stupid? I mean, God says, yes, compared to me, you're very stupid. <laughs> Verse 29, he gives power to us. Might as well say it. He gives power to the weak. That's us. That's you and me. That's, that's who he's talking about. He gives power to the weak. How many of you need power? I do. It is. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. That's me too. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I'm not going to say it to you too. But I have a feeling sometimes it is. Verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the, what? Lord. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who wait on the Lord, what's it mean to wait? I told you this is something you just do. Well, do no, this again. What's it mean to wait? What do you think of when you think of waiting? What? Sir? Most of us think of what? Waiting in line? Right? What? Doing nothing? Waiting. Just waiting. Most of us talk think about just waiting. I love to go to like Disney World or Holiday World and wait for like two hours. I love that. Right? hate that. But when we think of this first, sometimes we, that's, what we, that's what we all think about. Okay, I need strength. I need strength. And because of that, the best thing to do is to just, just wait. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, if I just wait and don't do anything, naturally you regain your strength, right? But that's not what this means. It means what you're saying. To wait on the Lord, like a waiter or a waitress. While you're being, while you need strength. You serve the Lord. Why? Because he's our Lord. The very definition of the word means master. He's our master. And we are to do what he tells us to do and asks us to do and implores us to do. Those who wait, wait on the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? While you're renewing my strength, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? I'll go wherever. You know, a good waiter or waitress, they will, they will. They will watch the tables, right? When you need a refill, boom, they're right there. They have it before you even ask, right? Or they, they wait. They, that's, that's what they want to do is they want to make sure that everything is a good experience for you. And it's the same way with God. Those who wait on the Lord, it says, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. 
They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, sometimes we go through situations in our life. Have you ever faced a situation that just seemed like you just soared right over it? Just, you faced it. It was difficult, but boy, it just seemed like, just like that. You just soared right over it like, like you were an eagle. Some of us feel like we're going through some problems and we're running. You know, you just kind of run through it, which is not as good as flying through it, but it's better than walking through it real slow. It's going by a little bit faster. And then some of us feel like we're just walking. You ever feel like you're just treading through it? <coughs> like you're like mud. You're just, it's just the way it is. But either way, the point here is this. If you're waiting on the Lord, he'll make sure you get through it. Why? Because he's the Lord. Now go back to that verse we skipped, verse 11. Because I think this is a, is a very beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. Because not only is He the Lord of creation, the Lord of wisdom, and the Lord of all nations, and the Lord of all idols, and the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, but He is also, it says here in verse 11, He will feed His flock like a The Lord is my The Lord. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm. And it doesn't stop there. You see, if, if a shepherd in those days were going to carry a sheep, they would fling it over their shoulder. Carry it. Especially if it's herd or something like that, they just carry it over their shoulder. But it doesn't stop there. Here's a picture of our Lord. Now guys, I may go the opposite direction today. They <laughs> may not be laughing. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And gently lead those who are with him. What I want you to see is we have a Lord who is our shepherd who will pick us up and carry us in his bosom. Carrying it in his bosom means it's, it's close to his heart, it's dear to it. If he knows the grain of sins, he cares enough about you so much to carry you when you're hurt. So when you're going through those valleys, whether you're soaring like an eagle, whether you're running or walking, whatever problem, he carries you. See, the good news is, is we may feel like we're treading through. That he carries us. You know, there's there's a there's a poem that has really over the years kind of got on my nerves. Footprints. Because you hear it over and over. You know what I'm saying? It's a great poem about how you know during the bad times he's God to carry you. But there's a truth in that, I believe. He carries us in his bosom because he loves us. If the band will come. That's the Lord that we serve. That's a, just a glimpse, just a glimpse of of the God that we serve. Turn over now to Psalm 23. I believe there's 17, if I count correctly, and depending on which version you use, but in the New King James, there are 17 personal pronouns in this, in this song. My or I. And I want you to read along with me. And I want you to notice those and personalize this. Because the, the very first line there is, the Lord is what? My shepherd. I want you to think about that. The, the Lord, who is the Lord of creation, who is the Lord of wisdom, and all that we just talked about. If David writes this song, and you and I can say the same thing. The Lord is my shepherd. Put your name there. The Lord is Mark's shepherd. Put your name there right now. The Lord is... Say that again. The Lord is... Personalize it. Let that sink into you. As if you are the only one in the universe... See, God, with His infinite knowledge and wisdom and power, can single you down to just an individual as if there was nobody else. But yet, think of us all simultaneously. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Personalize this now. Is this is your own personal song. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All because he's my shepherd and my Lord. Now, I don't know if he's the Lord of your life or not. Only you can answer that. But I hope. Now, if he's not today, if you'll make that decision to accept him as your Lord and your Savior, because he's not a liar and he's not a lunatic, he is Lord. And, you have, and only you can make that decision. If you'll stand, maybe you have a need. Maybe he is your Lord, but you need him to, to meet that need for you. I'd invite you to come as we sing, pray with you, or if you just want to pray on your own, that's what it's time.